so many different names for him for who he is whether it's father whether it's friend whether it's savior in each and every moment he's just what we need and that's why we sing he's worthy of his name and he's worthy of his name Oh 
voices now. If you believe this, would you sing with your whole heart? You are.
my Lord, I pour at your feet its treasure store. Take myself and I. very much to me based on the the songs that we sang is a truly a surrender posture and it's saying Lord I surrender all to you and I was reminded um, during worship during our first service today of when I was in my late 20s and I 
had been to college and, and uh, graduate school, and I was on a fast track in the medical field and, and had dreams and, and knew where I was going to go and, and financially was doing great, bought a house, car paid off, all those things. And then there was a call of, are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to give up what you think is best for what God thinks is best? And in that time of my life, this verse from uh, Matthew 10, 39 was so real to me. And it says, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. What an incredible promise that there is in that. And I was reflecting on that um, this past week because I was back in that medical center where I'd started over 30 years ago and reflecting on like, wow, I could be retiring now if I had stayed with that original plan. And my mind started to go to, wow, what if financially and, and all these things that I had dreamed about what could happen. And you know what's so awesome? is then I had this heart. I wouldn't give up the plan that God's had for me these last 30 years for anything. The surrender that was <laughs> challenging in my late 20s, and I say this to you, whatever your age is, I just have the benefit of, of some years to look back. What you think is good, he's got great for you. And that can be relationally, financially, um, your dreams and goals for yourself, for your family. So would you put your hands out in front of you today as a sign to say, Lord, I give it all to you. Even the things that seem good right now, I want you to take it. I give it, but will you take it? And some of you, it might be a slow release, and that's okay. And others, it might be like, yes, take it. But Jesus, I thank you that you are with us in every decision, every choice, every action that we make. And you know the beginning from the end. And you and the Father just have this incredible life, abundant life that's been promised to us. And so as we've sung these words today, now I ask that you would embed it in our heart, that we would be committed to live it. And Holy Spirit, as you have brought to remembrance now the things that we might be holding on to, they could be incredible dreams. They could be um, just, as I said, relationships. It could be just things that we thought life would be. Lord, I ask that you would take those things and may it be like the widow's might. It might just be too little next to nothings. But would you take it and make it what you have planned? Because it's an issue of trust. Surrender is all about trust. It's giving up my control and it's giving it to you to say, you be in control, master, and you lead and guide and I'll simply follow and obey. Even when it doesn't seem the most logical, yet it's the best. So we thank you for that. And Lord, give us just the grace to live out every day, surrender to you. In your name we pray, amen. 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 Well, go ahead and say hi and hey to people around you. Learn a name or two. It's fun to see so many of you here this morning. Well, Bailey and I are going to share with you some exciting things happening at Grove Point this summer. And it started out last week with um, our party in the park on Thursday. And it was hot, but it sure was. was fun. It was, It yes. was great. And I really feel like summers at Grove Point are about maximizing community. This is our chance to offer opportunities for those of you that have been here a long time, those of you that are new, just to get to know one another because we strive to live our values, and two of our very important values are intentional presence, being with each other, as well as joy and laughter. So I'm going to hand it over to Bailey, who's going to welcome all of you who might, this could be your first time. 
Yes, good morning. Um, like Pastor Leslie said, my name is Bailey. I'm the youth director here at Grove Point. And it is so good to have, oh, thank you. It is so good to have you guys here with us, especially those of you that it is your first time. So I just want to say a special welcome to you guys for joining us here this morning. We're so glad you came. As you walked in, each of you should have received a Grow card. So if you're new, if you could go ahead and fill that out and on your way out, drop it off at the table that says new here in the lobby. We just want to give you a gift for being here with us, get to know you a little bit here your story. Um, and then also this week, you will be receiving an email from us um, that gives you a list of different charities and nonprofits that uh, we partner with here locally. And we want to give them um, a donation on your behalf for joining us. And you get to have input on which charity we choose. So, All right. Yeah. Sounds great. Well, next week, we have officially renamed it to Sunday Fun Day. And it's going to look a little bit different than what we're used to. First of all, we're having one-hour services. So we'll have 9 to 10 and then 11 to 12. And we have the opportunity to kind of like uh, send off our youth who are headed to camp after the first service. And we have a missions team going to Nicaragua that we're going to pray over and send out after the second service. So that is going to be so fun. We've got some special treats planned. And... All of our kids entering first grade through fifth grade are going to join in the service because it's going to be an intentional intergenerational service. So it's going to be a fun time. Pastor Gabby is going to be leading yes. that for us. Yes, yeah, sounds like an amazing time. Unfortunately, all of our youth will not be there. We are leaving for summer camp on Sunday morning next week. We are taking 96 students and leaders to Miracle Camp next week, which is amazing. Um, and we are so grateful for this opportunity. We're so thankful for the ways that you have already partnered with us, but the job is not done because we still need your prayers. And so Sam has created a sign-up sheet because it is our heart that uh, every hour we are at camp, someone is intentionally covering our students and leaders in prayer and interceding for us um, because we believe in the power of prayer here at Grow Point. Amen. And so for you guys, if you would partner with us with this one last time for summer camp by uh, scanning that QR code and signing up for a, a time shift. Maybe uh, you only have uh, an hour a day or you want to sign up for the same hour each day. You have a lunch break that you know it's consistent. Your drive home or you just want to switch it up. Whatever works for you. Would you uh, consider covering us in prayer, partnering with us and our students and the work that God is doing? Um, because camp is important. Camp makes a difference and your prayers are a huge part of that. Absolutely. And we are not going to let Grow students have all the fun. <laughs> so we have Grow Kids Camp that's here on our Grow Point campus, and that is July 16th through the 18th. That is for kids that are entering first grade through fifth grade. And we have one afternoon where we're going off site, but otherwise we'll be here with tons of fun and games and water activities. But we need your kids to register in the next week. And you can go to our website to find that. It's $60 uh, per child. If that's a problem at all financially, please let us know. We don't want any child to be left behind. If, for a financial purpose. So I'm um, really looking forward to that. And if you'd like to serve at Grow Kids uh, Summer Camp, we would love to have that as well because we're expecting lots of kids. Uh, and then finally, another celebration time is baptisms. And that's going to happen on July 7th. And in order to sign up for that, we need you to go online so that we can be ready um, for those of you that want to be baptized. So just a summer of celebration happening, and we are so happy that you are going to be part of it. Awesome. Can we say thank you? I was trying to think through an analogy. I don't know that I really hit the mark during the first service. For whatever reason, I've got like kites on my mind today. Um, so I'm going to try a different one in this service, see if it lands a little bit better, because there's just a, a sense... Of, of life that I'm trying to articulate. And so I'll, I'll give an illustration based on a, per, a personal experience of mine when I was trying to learn how to kite surf, which requires a kite. Um, the person that was showing me how to manage this massive kite, which is like 12 feet wingspan, so that catches a lot of wind, right? I'm a big guy. And so I thought, I will be able to handle this. I thought, 
we would practice around water. We didn't. We practiced learning how to use this kite in the middle of a um, multiplex kind of soccer field. And it was a gusty day because you need some wind to learn how to do this kite surfing thing. And, um, and so we, we're all out there and you're kind of getting the hang of it. And then the instructor goes, okay, you just need to hold. And like, as he's saying, you need to hold on. There was a gust because there's like called the power zone where you dip the, the kite into the power zone and that's when it takes you places. And it took me places <laughs> that day. And first I lifted off the ground and, and then I couldn't get my footing uh, fast enough and I, like, within seconds, I was scooting across the field on my chest and legs, like face down and, and not knowing, like it felt like the full length of a football field, it was probably only like 20 feet. Nonetheless, I was just going for a ride with this thing, right? And until like I did something with the kite. Now the reason why I share that story is that life oftentimes feels that way. Can, does at least one person resonate like where, where just a few things happen in life and it's like, man, I'm just going for a ride here. And, and I wish I could say that I'm going for a ride in class, but actually I feel like a fool right now as I'm eating dirt and grass along the way. And so I have found that when certain windstorms of life happen, where it's like, um, whether it's something at home or something with one of your cars or just craziness in other people's lives that, and they're looking to you to like help out, man, it, it can, life can have a way of feeling like you're just getting dragged along. Can I say, can I get an amen on that? And and so this morning, my hope is to take us from that place of feeling like you're just getting dragged to, to leaving us with, with a sense of being encouraged. Like, man, so long as we maintain being tethered to Jesus and being filled and led by his spirit, it's not only that we're going to make it through, but man, we're, we're going to enjoy the ride along the way. And, and there is a delight and and, and laughter and encouragement along the way. And so this past week, I was, I was merging all of that stuff with this question in my mind of what is the ultimate purpose of the life of a Jesus follower? Um, so like the, the moment you determine in your heart like Jesus is who he says he is and, and you're like, I want to I want to give my life to him. I want to give my heart to him. I want to give my desires. Everything that I was pursuing before, like as Leslie shared earlier, like that that is is put on the cross and I want to give everything to Jesus. Um, so I went to social media and I, I threw that question out there and it was it was fun to see like 30 or more responses come in and and I was encouraged, like there's people from different states who were weighing in on that question. And, and really, in so many words, like you'd have phrases like to, to bring glory to, to God or to, to, to love God and love people and to um, make disciples. Real time right now, as you've heard that question, what is the ultimate purpose of the life of a Jesus follower? What would your words be? Like we can go popcorn style here this morning, but like what would you say is the ultimate purpose of a Jesus follower? Love others? Or love, love others? Serve? Lead? Spread the word? Discipleship? Protect? Sounds like we're creating a statement for law enforcement to serve, to protect. To... <laughs> yeah, all of those are, are good. And here, here's the thing. That, the answer to that question is still at play as we feel like we are getting drug across the ground during life. And that, that's where it gets really challenging to love Jesus in the mess. Can I get an amen? Because I don't know about you, but when I'm going through messes, I want to act messy with the mess, not like I belong to Jesus, right? right? Like his love 
has a way of being really far from my heart in the moments of, like when the, when the chaos hits, when the storms hit, when the winds hit. Like my first stop isn't always what is my purpose as a Jesus follower. Now there are times that that, that does happen. I mean, I, I like it when it's in my control. Like when I go to a room and, and I know I'm going there and I know the people that I'm gonna be around and, and I, and I kind of know what's going on in their life. I, I can be mindful of belonging to Jesus, being his representative, being like letting his life be lived through me. And, and I'm good with those moments, but when the unexpected interruptions hit, who am I then? And does who I am match my answer to what is the ultimate purpose in the life of a Jesus follower? Because storms do not erase that calling on our life. The unexpected moments, the things that we don't like, that we didn't ask for, like the common one here lately, for whatever reason, seems to be like a lot of vehicles going through some stuff. And I don't know what is happening with like vehicles are just like, I don't feel like working anymore. And so like when those, and, and it's not like back in the day where you have like a group of guys around the, the hood of it, looking into it, fixing it. It's like cars these days require like scientists. And so... The, the, so like that's just one part of it and then I don't know we had a little bit of heat this past week so I don't know if any of you were praying over your air conditioners like please just hold on for one more day I know that there is pain you know like I, I don't know if any of y'all were singing over your air conditioners but like literally like your, your mind is just like please just get us through this right and, and we could laugh about that but those realities really weigh, like whenever anxiety over the happenings of life, whenever anxiety like lands in the heart, it's amazing how quickly we can forget about the calling of living out his purposes, how quickly that goes away. And like we forget, like, yeah, I surrender all. Like I love that song. I love singing that song. But man, in the moments of the storms, how well do I live a surrendered life? I got a long way to go. Um, and so this morning, I don't know how many of y'all are like in the middle of that kite ride. Um, maybe you are in control of it and you're like, I, I got this handled. I'm ready to go. My hope is that as we get into the word this morning, that we look at this question, what is the ultimate purpose in the life of a Jesus follower? That we look, look to what the Word says, and then the question that we're going to bring ourselves to is, what part of life, of our life, is, is actively contrary to the life we know we ought to be living? Does that make sense? It'll make sense as we get into it. So, Heavenly Father, we pray over this time, and um, we ask that that the wisdom and the nudges and the whispers of your spirit would, would breathe life and wisdom and understanding. We are postured to hear you and hear from your word. And so we invite you to, to change and transform us through your word at this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Solomon was a pretty smart guy, right? If, you're, if you didn't know, now you know. Solomon arguably, aside from Jesus, one of the wisest men to, to walk the face of the earth. He wrote this, um, this collection of wise sayings, not only Proverbs, but then if, as you get into Ecclesiastes, many times people like avoid Ecclesiastes because it just seems like a downer of a book. But there's actually a lot of, of wisdom in it. And he, he ends this, this um, letter with this statement. And I imagine that he's... he's writing to his son, but um, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 read like this. Here, here now is my final conclusion. On everything that I've shared so far and everything that I've shared, this is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. It matters not what your opinion on the matter is. This is what I've Concluded after, after looking at life and, and looking at every layer of life, this is what 
is every, everyone's responsibility is this, fear God and obey his commands. God will judge us on everything. Can you all say everything? everything. Okay, well, I'm going to ask, ask you to say it one more time because I don't want it just to be words. I want us to really understand what we're reading here and what we're saying. And so it says, God will judge us for everything, everything, everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. That's how he ends this letter. Let's let this sobering truth be the last thing that you meditate on. Fear God, obey his commands, because God will judge everything. He will judge us for everything that we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. So there are some secretive things that we're like, man, like nobody else knows the good that I've been doing, and it's just between me and my father, and it's going to be pretty cool to hash that stuff out. And then, like, at the same time that we might be smiling and a little bit, you know, like, proud of that little spot of our life, then I don't know how many of y'all have other nooks and crannies of who you are as a person and what you have tucked away in your heart, your mind, your soul, those secretive areas that are not so good, that, that it, we might have fooled ourselves to think that we've kept it hidden from him, but he sees all of it. And I don't know what that moment will be like. I would love to think that it's going to be a really fast conversation where he's like, yeah, I see that, but let's keep going. I don't know. I don't know what that moment's going to be like, but he will judge us for everything that we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. That's, it sounds pretty, pretty weighty. But if we come back to what, our, what the purpose of our life is, in every aspect of life, it says to fear God. Not fear in like, I'm afraid of you, but fear in the sense of reverence and awe. Do we, do we have a reverence and awe of God generally, or do we have a reverence and awe of God in every aspect of life? Everything that we can identify from um, health to money to relationships, everything. Do we hold a reverence for God in all of those areas of life? And then the second to that is, are we obedient to him? And Jesus would be asked by some, some really smart people, like, hey, what's the most important command? And he would tell them, um, well, the, I think he maybe flipped it back on somebody, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And then sometimes I just throw some other words in there. But anyways, love the Lord your God. And then the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So that was the, um, the command or string of commands that Jesus would give. They weren't new commands, but there was some newness in the way that Jesus would speak those. It, it seemed to go a, a, away from it, deviated from this rigid, sterile, lifeless, like obligatory thing that we do to now Jesus is saying, love God and love others. I think we agreed, somebody threw it out there, like, to love God and love others. That's the purpose of the life of a Jesus follower. If we jump forward a little bit more, jump further back into the Bible, there's a letter that Paul writes to this church um, in a region called Galatia, and you get a sense, like, they started off really well. Like, they, they received the message of Jesus. They gave their life to Jesus, and then along the way, they're just crept in some some obscure teaching, and, and it kind of messed things up. And so he's writing this letter to them. And, and everything that we've just talked about so far, about the purpose of, of a Jesus follower, commands, law, all of these different words, Paul lands on all of that, but he's, he's helping them come from this place of, of relational obligation to a place of, 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 of delighting and, and life within the relationship. And he's saying that with everything that you will go through in life, now that you belong to Jesus, this is what life looks like. This might feel like a, a foundational, fundamental kind of message. I'm convinced that it doesn't matter how, how long we've been walking with Jesus or how little we've been walking with Jesus. We could hear these words every day of our life. We could read these verses every day. 
to, to continue to be kind of a, a litmus test or, or challenge our walk with Jesus, to, to refine it and keep bringing it to a place of, of life and not obligation. And so I want to encourage you to join me in Galatians chapter 5. Go ahead and start turning there. We're going to read a chunk of verses and, um, and walk through and see how our Heavenly Father would speak to us today through these verses. He, we come in midway through chapter 5, starting in verse 13. It says this, You've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Not this stringent, rigid, um, tethering yourself to the law, like if you do these things, then you're good. Um, even today, there are individuals that you could talk with. You might even be sitting in this room where you've been convinced and you've heard throughout your upbringing, if you do these things, then you're good. It's, it's more than doing. It's, it's, it, it will always come back to relationship. It will always come back to um, not performance, but faith. Sounds simple, but how... How quickly do we want to validate our faith by what we do rather than by the depth of our relationship with Jesus? We want to prove to people, oh, I, I did these things. I was about this stuff. And that is what lets it be known that I belong to him. But it goes, because we can all do right things. We can all do good things, but still have a heart that is distant from Jesus. In fact, there are some that would, they do, they place their confidence in their performance or the, 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 um, the accomplishments. And Paul perpetually says, you need to let, like, it's not that you stop doing those things, but that's not where your confidence comes from. So, this whole mindset of, of accomplishing relationship with God, he's like, you have been called to live in freedom my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. You may have been serving others all along, but now that you know Jesus, the manner in which you serve is a motivation and it's birthed out of your love and your affection for humanity. There's something profound that Jesus does where he tweaks the human heart to be more human towards one another. And like I said, you could be doing good things, but it's just doing. It's obligatory. And Jesus will rewire, he will literally transform your heart so that every outflow of your life is love. It's an expression of love. Use your freedom to serve one another in love. You get a sense that these words that he's writing are intentional because people, one, either were caught up in that whole like performance thing or on the other side of the spectrum, they were like, oh, all we need is faith. Okay, I have faith in Jesus. Now I can do whatever I want to do. And I don't know... Like immediately, all of us, if we have a, a, you know, a healthy mind, we would understand that that's not how this is supposed to work. We were not set free so that we can do whatever we want. We were set free from sin to be bound to Jesus. And even being set free to lovingly be bound to one another and I think we will spend a lifetime getting comfortable and understanding how that works from one another. Like healthily, lovingly being in community. Not out of obligation. Man, how, how like just gross does it feel when if you've ever had like the, the moment where where you were included in a group and, and then you learned later on that, like, I think of school gathering or school outings and whatnot. You thought you were a group because those, that group wanted you to be in the group, but really you were part of that group because the teacher assigned you to the group. You know what I'm saying? And so that group was obligated to have you in their group. And maybe that's just me venting my insecure childhood, okay? But, um, like, there's a difference of being assigned and it being obligatory 
And in the polar opposite of that, of, of like, no, we are so thrilled that you are here. This is a, like, it's amazing. Like, we have, we have a spot for you. We have a seat for you. Our heart has a space for you. There's a, comp- there's a massive difference between the two. And we will spend a lifetime figuring out how to be in a healthy community. And he goes on. He says this in verse 14. The whole law can be summed up in this one command. Remember, Solomon said, fear God and obey his commands. Here we have a command. The whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But here's the deal. If you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Be, beware of destroying one another. I don't get the sense that there's a pervasive like biting at one another within this church family. But without question, okay, if there ever was a year for this to happen, I would believe this would be the year for it to happen. And you could probably say that in the election year. Part of the reason, and man, I I really botched it in the first service, because really the whole premise of asking the question, what is the ultimate purpose of the follower of Jesus? The reason why God brought that question to my heart is so that we will be prepared for later this year and as we make our way to this election, because there are so many Jesus followers who as they fill their mind with news more than the word, they begin to, that's where the biting and the devouring happens. You don't believe like me, you're a fool. You, you're not, you have the same persuasions as I do, you're a fool. What does that language have to do with what we just read about loving one another and being the body of Christ together? Man, I was even diving into the prayer that Jesus prayed. This is in the Gospel of John. One of Jesus' final prayers was for believers, that there would be such unity among the believers that that would be a message to the culture and to the world. And so I was even asking myself, not, not only the body of believers, but I was thinking about this from church to church. What is the extent of unity among churches in Lorain County, and how does that witness to the world? And I, I kind of threw up in my mouth a little bit when, when I, I got, got settled on the answer because I'm like, I don't know... Like, I think we're cordially unified, but not deeply relationally unified. And so is the church today letting Jesus down on his own prayer? Like, I was, I was wrestling with that. And so, okay, so that's church. I, I could make that a soapbox, but we'll come back to this house here. As we make our way forward, and like, yeah, Olympics, I'm so excited about the Olympics. I love it. I, love, I think there's a unifying that happens. It's, it's awesome, right? But then also, all along the way, there's this other spinning wheel in the back of many minds that this election is this all-important, this, this is going to bring, like, this, this matters for eternity. And I don't want to belittle it disrespectfully, but then I don't want to give it so much stage presence that it's like, that's not what the focus is either. And all along the way, that question, what is the ultimate purpose of the life of a follower of Jesus, still is at play even during an election year. How you treat one another during these days matters. Matters to Jesus matters to the body of Christ. It matters to people who are hanging on by a thread of hope and they just might walk through these doors and if they hear biting at each other because of political views, they're like, I'm out. I thought I would find hope or Jesus or something here, but I'm not digging what I'm feeling. And again, let me just be clear. I'm not catching this pervasive thread within this body. I just want to get in front of it so that it doesn't become a windstorm that catches us by surprise. So my pastoral charge today is that today you would orient your heart, tether your heart to the love of Jesus and the love of one another. And if part of that 
living out your purpose, where Jesus even said, if you want to follow me, crucify yourself daily, take up your cross, crucify yourself, then follow me. Some, many believers daily need to crucify politics and follow Jesus. It doesn't mean that we don't care about what's going on in our nation, but it does mean that we understand that our nation is not at the epicenter of the Bible. <laughs> Todd and I talk about this sometimes. Did you know that America is not listed anywhere in the Bible? <laughs> but there are many who think that it is. Or at least they live that way. And I love this nation. I love the United States of America. But my allegiance first is to Jesus. Then my allegiance is to one another, the big brushstroke of humanity. I don't know. Anyways, it's like we get surprised every four years that, that this is how our nation functions and that this is the one. That, that, that's what we said last time. And we're still here, loving Jesus. My car still, cars still break down. People still hit in turmoil, like with or without the chaos of political stuff. And I'm probably, anyways, I, the, like I have my own wrestling match of like how much to talk about politics. So anyhow, but it's a real thing, y'all. Verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. And then, and then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. If we are caught up with, if, if we make our soapboxes more important than humanity, we're missing the love of Jesus. Well, my soapbox is rooted in the love of Jesus. Well, okay. But if your soapbox robs people of dignity like, so, so this is one of my favorite things about the, God's definition of freedom. Remember, we started with this. You've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. God's definition of freedom. I love this. This is so good. God's definition of freedom is restoring dignity to humanity. That's what God is about. God wants to restore dignity to humanity. There is so much that goes on in the world, so many injustices in the world that rob people of dignity. And wherever the presence of the living God is invited and welcomed and pursued, what you will naturally and supernaturally see is a restoration of the dignity to humanity. So, if your soapbox is a loud voice that devalues or diminishes or belittles anyone else, then, then I would argue with you to, I, I would try to encourage you to maybe bring that soapbox before the cross of Jesus and say, and, and really just admit, like I've made this bigger than this, and, and so there, this is a part of me that needs to die. And in dying, what, I'm, what I recognize happens, when I die, you live. And so I, anything that's off or off base or, or me-centered, I wanna die to that so that Jesus can live and I can love well, I can speak well, I can speak life. 
So these two forces are constantly fighting against each other. And when they do that, you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation to the law of Moses. It's not about do's and don'ts. It's about living out of life and love. And then it's, it's kind of crummy to, to read all of these, but we'll, we'll do it real quick. I'm by no means going to make a 15-point sermon right here on all of these gro- gross parts about the sinful nature. But he's just saying, if we're not living by the Spirit, this, this is the fruit of a life that is not surrendered to Jesus and led by the Spirit. The desires of the sinful nature. When you follow the desires of the sinful nature, these are the results. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. And let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living Anyone who has made a lifestyle of these, hidden or known, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. This isn't just heaven talk. This is right here, right now talk. Jesus' death on the cross gave us real-time, right now, access to the Father that we, we, we can take advantage of right now. And then there's a subsequent full-on, unrestricted entering his presence, and that's what heaven and eternity is. But even now, the, the lifestyle, the pattern of living that is that, that list of the sinful nature, there's no access to the kingdom of God. And there's a huge but that he puts in verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love. Is that not one of the responses to the life of a Jesus follower? Love others. Love God. Love others. The fruit, those that live by the Spirit, the evidence of the life of the Spirit within is first love, then joy. So that means that we love people well and we are eager to laugh with people, not laugh at, but laugh with. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which, by the way, self-control is like the, the knot that ties up all of these. Because if you think about it, if you go back through all of the different fruit that are produced by the sinful nature, all of them lack self-control. All of them are centered on the self. And whatever the self wants, there is no control of the self when the self wants something. Any of y'all relate to that where it's like you, you pick whatever your area is that maybe has been a stronghold or that's been like this, um, this thorn in the side, as Paul would say. You're good, you're good, you're good, you're good. A moment happens, a word is said, um, something is seen, and it's just like, like a flood, all self-control it, like is not even on the same scope, like not even on the radar. And it's just all in. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And then something happens. Several nights of no sleep, um, stressful decisions that you need to be made, tragedy strikes other places um, and that are close to, to in relationship to you. And it's just like the pile and pile and pile and pile of stuff. And then it's like the stuff that seem to have been controlled, there's no self-control. And usually it's because in the midst of all of that stuff, the, the sleepless nights and the tragedy and all of that kind of stuff, what tends to happen is, is because there's just exhaustion. And if I'm speaking really plainly about this, it's because I've lived this, okay? What seems to go first is, is the wherewithal to, to even utter the words, Jesus, I need you. 
Because usually it's like, dear God, I just need sleep. And it's not, it's not a crying out. You're just making statements. You know what I'm saying? It's not drawing to him. You're just like, it's, it's a tantrum. It's pouting. It's, it's, it's crying out the injustice of experiencing the pains of life. And what tends to hit the wayside is any allegiance or commitment or, or attachment to the presence of God. And when you... When you let go of the presence of God, then so quickly do we begin living for self. And there's nothing good that comes when we live for self. Never. Even the ones that seem good, you, you, you dig long enough, you'll see that there's selfishness at the, at the root of that. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires. The, the real way that that would be laid out would be this. They have nailed the passionate desires. It's, it's two words lumped into one essence. Those have been nailed. The, the passionate desires of their sinful nature have been nailed to his cross and crucified them there. That is what has happened to Jesus' followers. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their passionate desires to his cross. We have a tendency of wanting to walk up to the nails and unpin them, right? And Paul would even say that. We keep doing these things, we're nailing Jesus to the cross again. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading. Now watch this, full circle. Let us follow the Spirit's leading in every, y'all say every. every. In every part of our lives. What did Solomon say? God will judge us for everything that we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Jesus is after the every part of our lives. The Spirit of the living God wants to live through every part of our lives. There, there's the thing that we all have in common, there's the production and the projection that everybody sees and we're like see Jesus is in these parts of my life that you see but we need to understand there are all kinds of other parts of our lives that even those that are closest to you don't know about here's what's crazy even you might be unaware of like these hidden, whether it be motives or desires or passions, he wants to go through all of the, his presence wants to permeate through all of those different layers of life so that we die to self and he can live and our heavenly father receives all credit, kudos, glory. Amen? Our tendency, though, we just don't, we don't like saying how human we are. But I promise, if we allow the presence and the power of His Spirit to be alive, and if we tether ourselves there and keep ourselves there, there's so much life. And then here's what's, ha- here's what's happening. Rather than being thrown in a tailspin, when, when just craziness has happened, or life has happened, the storms happen, the wind happens, we are able to continue to love him well and love others well. And what I'm not saying, I'm not inviting us into an impossibility of never feeling anything, because I think that there's a notion of like, so I'm not able to ever just acknowledge that life is tough? No, I don't, 
that's not the invitation. But it's a perpetual invitation to die to self. So, if, as you, if you would, gra- grab the grow card this morning. We'll have up on the screen the QR uh, code that you, if you want to do this from your phone. The neat thing about that is that you'll get an email of your response. Two, two parts here. In your own words, what would you say is the ultimate purpose in the life of a Jesus follower? And then as you've written that down, the second part of that, I want, I want to invite you to investigate. What's one area that is immediately inconsistent with the fruit of the Spirit? If we went through, if, like, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all of that. And, and we acknowledge, like, yes, that is, that should be evident in the life of a Jesus follower. What's one area that is inconsistent with that? Where you would say, I don't want, I don't want to pretend like, I've, like I'm hiding this anymore. And so I'm just going to speak to it so that I can die to it, so that Jesus can live within it. Amen? What is the purpose of a Jesus? What is the ultimate purpose in the life of a Jesus follower? Write that in your own words. And then what part of life is inconsistent with everything that we've just talked about? If you're new to to grow point or even if you're new to the grow card it's it's just our way of responding to the message and if you're like I don't I don't know yet but there are some things going on in life the grow card is also a great way to to let us know how we can be praying for you so if there's just stuff going on in life please don't hesitate to to write down a few words on how we can be praying for you been here this morning or as you've been here this morning if you've come in and you're like I, I've heard about Jesus and a little bit about you know what he's done everything that we're talking about it it first begins this this life first begins with saying yes to Jesus and, and what does that even mean it means acknowledging that he came that he is heaven sent he came here he was crucified and he was resurrected. All of that was for you and for me. His death on the cross is is that he paid the penalty of our sin and the significance of him raising to life is that he conquered death through his resurrection. 
And so when we say yes to Jesus, we're saying yes to all of that. But the most remarkable part of that is those areas that we're just like, man, I'm just, I'm just accepting, like this is just what it's going to be. The resurrection power of Jesus is just divine in the way that he, that, that power is, is supernatural in the way that it transforms lives. And so when we say yes to Jesus, we're, we're saying we, we want to receive all of that. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work within us. And so that's that's where things begin. And it's not just a one-time, today kind of decision. It's it's every day saying yes to Jesus and inviting that work to happen. And so this morning, we're going to pray together collectively. But if you're praying this for the first time, please let us know. Because we want to encourage encourage and affirm that decision. uh, and And then continue walking out this relationship with you. So can we do this real strong together? I'm going to lead us in this prayer. And then, um, and then we're going to wrap up in a very intentional way. But let's start with this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today I say yes to Jesus. His death wipes away my sin. I have forgiveness through his death. I have new life because of his resurrection. From this point forward, my life, my decisions, my attitude, it all belongs to him. I say yes to Jesus today. Jesus name. Amen. Okay. Now this is the part that I didn't prepare you for. I want to encourage you to to get in groups of of three or four, somewhere around there. And if you would um, just share like a statement about life right now. If If it's tough, just say life is tough because this. Okay. And it doesn't need to be a novel. Um, and, and if life is, is good and it's, it's, it's solid, then say that as well. But to conclude our time, I just see us as a, as a church family speaking prayers of encouragement over one another. And so let's be church family today. Um, and if you're a guest with us this morning, I know that can kind of be like, ah, I don't know. Um, it, it, we're, we're simply praying to our Father in heaven, the same one that we just prayed to, all right? But go ahead and form like groups of three or four and and speak words of encouragement over one another. All right?